Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you all this morning. A bit overcast, a bit like yesterday, but uh, it'll get nicer as the day goes on. And a very warm welcome to any visitors we have with us this morning. Uh, as is our uh, tradition here in Granton, uh, if I could invite you to get up and give a, a good grant and welcome to anyone you might not have seen or spoken to yet this morning. And there will, of course, be plenty of time to chat afterwards over tea and coffee. Right. And, of course, we want to welcome everyone who's with us on Zoom this morning. And if you could give them all a nice grant and wave. We've got people in from Edinburgh, from East Lothian, from Barnet, from Greenwich, from Windsor, from Cardiff, from Italy, and even this morning from far-flung South Uist. Right. A warm welcome to, to everyone. Now, a few announcements. Um, family worship, not meeting in July. We have the new uh, digital bulletin, which Chaz has been working very, very hard on. So if you see anyone in church with their phone out, don't think that they're being rude or not listening to the sermon or playing games or whatever. They will be looking at this new digital bulletin uh, and it's easy to find uh, and easy to navigate. So it saves us a bit of paper. So as a green congregation, that's no bad thing. Uh, so if you can get it on your phone, uh, please do have a look at it. That'll be great. Now, thanks to David having a, an article published in Life and Work, which was very good, I have to say. I thoroughly enjoyed reading it, David. Um, we now qualify for a 20% discount on Life and Work. So anyone who wishes to uh, purchase Life and Work uh, should speak to Norman or to David. Uh, Friday drop-in. This happens, obviously, um, on a Friday, usually um, early afternoon, but they're going for a new time and uh, they're going from 12 to 1. It's going to run through the summer, but they're going to have one week off, and that's going to be on Friday the 8th of June. So that's the week after the schools finish. Okay. Uh, sorry, it says June here. One week off in the 8th of July. Of course, we're well past... We're well past... <laughs> sorry, 8th of July. Right. And uh, last but not least... Uh, thanks to everyone who organized and helped with and attended yesterday's barbecue, where everyone was fed up, uh, sorry, was, was, was well fed. Sorry, my, my writing's terrible at times. So, without any further ado, let us start our service with our first hymn this morning, which is For All the Saints.
Our reading today comes from the book of Acts, verses 32 uh, to 35, and I'll be reading from the King James translation this morning. And so it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydia. And there he found a certain man, came Anesius, which he had kept in bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ, maketh thee whole, arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. All that dwelt at Lydia and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. Now, I wanted to start today by echoing uh, Stuart's thanks for everybody who helped with the barbecue. Uh, I want to especially thank St. Sandra for her wonderful work there. I'd also like to thank St. Neil and St. Ian for the lovely burgers they cooked. Uh, St. Derek and St. Linda, they did a wonderful job as well. But, you know, we also want to thank everyone who makes this service possible. Thank you, St. Stuart, for your your lovely welcome there. Thank you, St. Chaz, for your work on the sound desk. And then through the week, of course, thank you to St. Sylvia, St. Barbara, St. Olive, St. Irene and St. Dorothy for doing the lunch club. Thank you, St. Sandra, for doing the coffee morning. And the blessed St. Norman will soon be giving us a message from the Bible. Now, you might be wondering, have your letters from the Vatican gone missing? (laughs) Has the Pope got something to tell you that you weren't quite expecting? Well, I can tell you with assurance, I said absolutely nothing wrong, because you are all saints, even if you didn't realize it. I can say that because it says so in the Bible. Now, I was, you notice I read from a different translation. I brought with me my interlinear King James, New King James, NIV, parallel New Testament in Greek and English. Actually, this column here belongs once to Alan Hamilton Messer, so thank you, Alan, for giving this to me. But I brought this along because this is a version of the New Testament with three different translations in it. So I read to you from the King James. If I had read to you from the New Testament, that very first verse would have said, as Peter travelled around the country, he went to the Lord's people who lived in Lydia. But I chose the King James because it said he went to the saints in Lydia. So which is right? Well, it's got on one side the two English translations, on the other it has the Greek. And if you see the Greek word here, it says hagios. Now hagios means holy one. When Hagias was translated into Latin first, that became Sanctus, and that came down to English to the word saints. And so Paul visited all the saints in Lydia. And that doesn't mean that he visited some super elite group of like perfect Christians. What it meant was he visited all the ordinary Christians who lived in Lydia, and they were all saints. So you might now be wondering, if everyone was saints, what does it mean to be a saint? Well, I've got four pictures here. If you go to the next one after that, that can help us understand. This to identify, you'll know what the top left is. That is, of course, a fire blanket. What is the top right? Not just any silverware, the family silverware, a very specific kind of silverware. Now, the bottom left, do you have any idea what that might be? Well, this is the best picture I could come of it, because it's called a, a trousseau. If you're less fancy, you might call it the bottom drawer. And this is this place where people, uh, people who are not yet married, women, would put things for their wedding. So that's a traditional name for it. Most people just had a drawer in their house, and that's where you might put some jewellery. You might put a dress, it might be something, and eventually, on your wedding day, you would wear all those things. And lastly, does anybody recognise what's on the bottom right? The crown jewels. What do all these things have in common? It's a bit tenuous, I know. They are all set aside for a purpose. Do you wrap yourself up in a fire blanket to keep warm? No, you keep it for a very specific purpose. Do you give the family silver to anyone? No, only when the minister's coming for a visit. Uh, If a trousseau is there for your wedding, then of course that means that it's stuff you've saved up for one special day. And do you think the queen wears the crown when she's having her breakfast in the morning? No. She, or maybe she does, actually. Maybe once in a while, just, you know, just to test it on for sizing. No, she keeps most of the crown jewels for special occasions. These are all things that are set aside for a very specific purpose. And actually, when you hear the word in the Bible, holy, that's actually exactly what it means. It means something that's set aside for a special purpose. 
So the absolute holiest place in the Bible used to be the temple. Now, the temple wasn't magic. It wasn't necessarily built out of the most special stone. Why was it holy? Because it was set aside as the place to worship God. It was the same with the priests. The priests weren't exactly the best, the most perfect people in the, in the land. They were just the people who were set aside to, to work in the temple, follow the specific rules so that they could worship and serve God. And actually, you're going to see this today when we have communion. Now, we are not the most high church in the land. We have a quite low church approach to communion. But even at Granton, there will be a point when Norman does the communion when he sets aside the bread and the wine for all common purposes. And that's not to say that it becomes magic or it becomes anything like that. What it is, it becomes set aside for the specific purpose of communion. And that's what makes it, that's when it becomes holy to us because it has a purpose. And when I say that you are saints, or all of us are saints, what I mean is that we are set aside for a purpose. God has called us to be part of his mission, his, his work in the world, the work of loving people, caring for creation, of building a, a more just and fair world. And so when you become a Christian, you're drafted into this great big team. In 1 Peter 2, Peter says to the church, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy, so a set aside for a purpose, nation, God's special possession. Now, there is a bit of a misconception when you hear the word saint that it means being perfect. And of course, that's because, you know, the people who get the, the official title, the saints of this world, were pretty good people. And you, you probably picture in your head when you hear a saint, someone like, you know, St. Francis, you know, saintly, not many possessions, occasionally talks to birds. Is there anyone here who would consider themselves saintly, uh, low on possessions, and occasionally talks to birds? That's probably the best. I believe you would talk to birds, Thomas. <laughs> but there, you know, that, that, that's not how most of us live. And that, so that idea of calling ourselves saints seems quite strange. But actually, when you think about it from that other meaning, set aside for a purpose, it makes a whole bunch more sense. And it doesn't matter that we're not perfect. Now, ever since COVID, we have gone over to using communion wafers. I heard the discussion, we might be going back to bread. Who knows? Fingers crossed. Is a communion wafer the best kind of bread you have ever had? Is it the most tasty, most delicious? Not exactly. And I don't mean any offense, but the communion wine, is it the best wine you have ever had in your whole life? If it is the best wine you've ever had, then we need an intervention, I think. Because it's lovely. You know, there are better wines out there. But is, does that mean that our communion is any less special because it's not the finest bread and the finest wine? No, because that's not the point. The point isn't that it's the most beautiful bread you've ever tasted, the most gorgeous wine. The point is that we set aside as a, for a special purpose so that we can connect with God. You are holy not because you're perfect, but because God has chosen you to be a part of his work, to help him in that project of loving and caring for the world. We are called to be that holy people, a people who share a message of hope, of joy, that God loves us, God cares for us, and that we are all invited to care for one another. So in classic Granton fashion, I'd like you to turn to the person next to you and say to them, you are a saint. And I want you to then turn again to the person next to you and I want to say, I am a saint. Okay. Well, thank you all. It's lovely to be with you. And now I'd like to invite Saint Ian up, who's going to be leading us in our prayer. Thank you, David, for bestowing these honors upon us. It was you, O God, who formed me in my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Let us pray. O Lord of all life, we greet you this new day. Let all creation praise you. Let the daylight and the shadows praise you. Let the fertile earth and the swelling sea praise you. Let the winds and the rain 
Let the lightning and the thunder praise you. Let all that breathes, both male and female, praise you. And we shall praise you, O God of all life. O healer of souls, shield us from sin. When we go astray and stumble, O healer of souls, shield us from sin. This day, may life be in our speech and truth in what we say. May the life Christ Jesus gave be filling every heart for us. May the life Christ Jesus gave be filling us for everyone. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The second reading this morning is from 1 John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the God, Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a pra- practice of sinning, for God seeds abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Thanks be to God. There are there was a, a time in this world, and uh, sorry, in this country, and indeed all over the world, when um, kind of jobs ran in families, and the job that you had often became your surname. So if you have a look onto the screen, just I've just kind of got a few of these to show you, so they'll be up there. Uh, my own name, uh, next one, please, Chaz. My own Smith, Painter, Carpenter, Walker, Thatcher, Cooper, all of these names. And they were kind of, they just described what people did. And someone was very proud when the next generation took on the job that, that they were doing. And it was, it was rites of passage when a father or a mother passed on the tools to the next generation. And as the tools had served them, so the tools would serve the son and then the grandson and kind of so on. And there was, there was great pride in passing on the tools and seeing the tools being used. Now, I brought, on a, I brought today something to show you, and I've shown some of this before, a tool that has been passed down from one generation to the next in our family. Uh, 
There's not much use for this in Granton. Um, where's Neil? Let's get the proper pronunciation of this. Neil? Yes, we are, because he's from the Southern Isles, and I'm from the North. How would you pronounce it out in the sticks? Trauschka. Right, so he would say that we're, we would pronounce it very differently. Actually, we would pronounce it correctly. But this is, uh, this is my father's peat cutting iron. Okay? So this was in, in the shed in our house, and um, out in, in the shed. And you often find weird things in the shed. And as far as I was concerned, this was nothing more than a peat cutting iron until one day I explained to my uncle Angus, my father's older brother, and said, Yeah, I found this peat cutting iron in the shed. And I said, and the most amazing thing about it, and you can't see this because they're rusted, is, is the, there's two studs in the top of the peat cutting iron. And then, without so much as skipping a beat, my Uncle Angie said, that was your father's peat cutting iron. He put the two studs in it to say that that was his. So this now is not just a peat cutting iron, this is my father's peat cutting iron. And at some point, when I am older and more decrepit, I will pass this on probably to one of Murdo's kids, my brothers. So it will go down the generation. The chance of any of us actually cutting peats with it is slim, I have to say. Although I, I, was, I was a bit worried walking up to the church with it when a police car went past and slowed down. <laughs> As, uh, as you look like the Grim Reaper with this thing over your shoulder, walking along and granting, going, hello, officer, yes, nothing wrong, nothing wrong here. Um, but, you know, we, we're surrounded by things that connect us. Now, if you're on Zoom and you're at home, or uh, one of the great things being at home is you can look around and you can see the things that connect you to generations that have gone before. We can't really do that here, but just close your eyes for a minute and think about your living room or, or your kitchen or that, and think about all the things in your house that connect you to the generations that have gone before to your wider family. And I'm sure you can all home in on some things. You've done that? Now look around the church. And um, I don't know if we can do a wide angle on the church chance to, to show people, but look about all the things, if you like, that connect us to our Father. Only this time, it's our spiritual father. So you have, I often play this game when the kids come across. If I give you 30 seconds, how many crosses can you count? Go on, give it a go. How many crosses can you count? Remember to look behind you. Okay. Right, what did you get? Six. Six, ten, right. Did you get the biggest cross? The church is a cross, that's right. The church is shaped like a cross. So we have that. We have many Bibles around. We have the three different versions, four different versions, including the Greek. We have the different version again, the Good News, the Pew Bibles. We have banners that proclaim the faith. We have a pulpit that works as a great stand for the TV. Um, we have a baptismal font. We have a lectern. We have a communion table that we'll be using later. We have piles of stuff around here that connects us with God. But actually, you may have missed the main thing that connects us with God in this church. Don't you know what that is? It's each other. We are made in the image of God. And so that means you are made in the image of God. It means the person sitting next to you is made in the image of God. So we are the, the greatest thing in this church, whether on Zoom or whether here, that actually connects us with God. So go and look at the person next to you. Look, go and really look at them and think about how they are made in the image of God. That's quite something, isn't it? Now, you might say that David and I are havering in what we're saying, telling you today, but we keep quoting this thing in the Bible to prove to you that what we're saying is not havering. And here's another bit of quote from the Bible. So it should come up here. Let's have a look at it. Yes. So this is from the reading in John. 
See how much the Father has loved us. His love is so great that we are called God's children. And so, in fact, we are. That is why the world does not know us. It has not known God. My dear friends, we are now God's children. But it is not yet clear what we shall become. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he really is. Who takes after their mother? Anyone willing to put their hands up? Who takes after their father? Who takes after their granny or granddad? Who says they're totally unique? <laughs> One or two, was it? okay, right in here, yeah. But we do, we take after other people. And the Bible says we are like God. That means we should be taking after our Heavenly Father. And you probably guessed that today, the very last day of our Seasons of Faith series, and we're going on to look at the parables, we decided to look at sainthood, the kind of end of the process of life. And there are different ways to becoming a saint, as David alluded to. And I thought I'd share with you the Roman Catholic process for becoming a saint. I don't know if you know this one. So you are. So if you look at it here, it's there. So, you, so it says, you have to wait five years after someone dies. So nobody in here can be a saint. Why? Because I think you're... Hands up if you're alive. <laughs> Actually, put your hand up if you're dead. Okay, right, there, okay. So, so none of us can be a saint according to this system. And when I looked into why the five-year wait was there, it's to allow emotions to calm down so you can make a rational decision, okay? The next thing you have to do is you have to, what the colleague says, get designated a servant of God. And, and you, that's not just a, a kind of thing that's put against your name. There's a special commission formed. So there's a committee that investigates your life. Would you like your life to be investigated in the most minute detail before you were proclaimed a saint? I wouldn't like that, that's for sure. The next one I love is brilliant. Show proof of a life of heroic virtue by passing the committee scrutiny and having your name passed to the Pope. I, I can see there's a lot of heroic virtue in front of me here today, whether you're in person or, or whether you're online. And then the next one is, have some miracles attributed to you that can be verified. They must be verified to the satisfaction of the committee. And, you know, when I was looking into this, apparently <coughs> getting a, 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 four, a, a birdie four and a par five is not a miracle according to them. But I would beg to differ on that one. Um, and then the last one is you have to be canonized via a special mass recounting your life and the miracles that you did. And then you will join one of the 10,000 or so recognized saints. How's that for a process? In our branch of the Christian faith, it's much, much easier. Because as David said, every single person who comes to faith is a saint. I'm going to take you to a different text than the one he took you to. I'm going to take you to, the, I think it's 1 Corinthians. Here we are. To the church of God, which is in Corinth, to all who are called to be saints, who belong to him in union with Christ Jesus, together with all people everywhere uh, who worship our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. You do not need to do miracles. You do not need a committee to decide that you are a saint. Why? Because God has already determined that you are a saint. And, and what does this actually mean, though? What's the implications of this? That's the question. Um, and it, when it says, you know, we are God's children, it's quite something to say that, isn't it? You and I, we are God's children. It says we don't know what we're going to look like. We'll be different to this. But we have been made God's children as determined by God. And at its most basic level, that's what sainthood is. It's, it's being declared by God to be one of his children. And not only when you die, but also now. So go and say to, say to each other again, just to reinforce that thing. You know what I'm going to say? Say it. Say it to the person beside you again. You're a saint. But change it. Change it. Say to them, right here, right now, you're a saint. Yeah, imagine that. Right here, right now, you're a saint. But as I say, in due course, things will change and we'll become like God. Now, you may not feel like a saint, but you are. You may not even have behaved like a saint this morning, 
but you are. That is what God has done for you. And there are real, real world implications of being a saint. And I'm going to demonstrate those to you in part two. But in the meantime, we'll have our song, which is Come People of the Risen King. look at this slide. Look at this slide that should come up momentarily. This is you, right? Say that. Say, that is me. All right. The thing is, there's not only you. There's a few more people around this world in addition to you. In fact, there are 7.95 billion people in the world. This is what it was when I looked up. And of that 7.95 billion, 2 billion claim to follow Jesus Christ. That's quite a lot of people, isn't it? But you know, when we think about this, actually, this is, this is not really right. We shouldn't be working with a, a number of 2 billion. Let's go to the next slide just to get some perspective. Statisticians reckon that from the beginning when humanity emerged, that there have been 117 billion people that have ever lived. That's a huge number, isn't it? That's an absolutely huge number. 117 billion people to date. We don't know how many of these people are Christians. And you know what? That is just 
the left hand, if you like, that's just one side of the timeline from past to present, because how many more people will live from this time on until Jesus comes back? It could be another 117 billion. It could be another a billion billion, or a hundred billion billion. We just don't know. But this is what the Bible has to say about it. It's quite interesting. This is from Revelation. After this, I looked, and there was an enormous crowd. No one could count all the people. They were from every race, tribe, nation, and language. And they stood in front of the throne and of the Lamb, dressed in white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. They called out in a loud voice, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Every single one of these people there is a saint. All of those who came before, all of those who are here, and all of those who will come after and follow Christ are saints. And we are all connected together in one family. Now consider what this means. Do any of you recognize this place? It is one of the most significant properties in Edinburgh. Take it from an interesting angle. It's not the angle most people see it. It is Warriston Crematorium down the road. That is exactly right. We gather there, don't we, when we lose people to say goodbye to them. Have you ever said, we lost so-and-so this year? I bet you've used that terminology with someone. Well, I have to tell you, no Christian should ever use the terminology, we've lost someone, because our people are not lost. God knows exactly where they are. They have gone before us to be with God, and at some point it will be our turn to go and be with God. We will not be lost. We will just move, if you like, from this existence to the existence that is yet to come. And, and, you know, if you're listening to this, and, and, you know, a loved one has died, they are not lost. God has not lost them. God knows perfectly well where they are. And even though we cannot see them, this is part of what it means to be a saint. Now, I'm going to go on to some really shaky ground next. I'm going on to shaky ground for two reasons. The first reason is that in secondary school, I failed French. The second reason is that Jo is a fluent French speaker and she's sitting at the back of the church. So I'm going to share with you two words. Anyone here know French? A few people know some French. Okay, we could be in real trouble here, David. Right. The difference between adieu and au revoir. So you've come across these two. I'm, I, am, I am potentially right in thinking, but I'm looking at faces here because I could also be potentially wrong, and, and the faces will tell me, but I'm potentially right in thinking that adieu has a, final, has a finality to it, that when you use a, adieu to someone in French, what you're saying to them is, cheerio, I don't expect to see you again for quite some time, if at all. But when you say au revoir to someone, you are saying to them, goodbye, I will see you soon. Is that correct? Yes. Right. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Uh, What you can see is that I got it wrong in my notes first time around, and I had to replace it all. Okay, so, when a Christian dies, when a saint dies, it is never adieu, or adieu. How do you pronounce it? Adieu, okay. For the correct pronunciation, see Joe after the church. Right, so it is never adieu. It is always au revoir, because we will meet them again. Why? We go back to the passage we had in John. Here it is. It says, See how much the Father has loved us. His love is so great that we are called God's children. And so, in fact, we are. You can just stop there. God has made us his children. Death for us is not an end. It is a transition for Christians from one type of existence to another. I'm going to show you a picture that to you won't mean much. But this picture, to me, actually means pretty much everything. Here you go. Do you know who that is? That is my dad. That is 
Robert, or as he was known, Bobby Smith. And that is him when he was receiving his certificate in social work because he was a warder in the poor house in Stornoway. And what you can't see, and it's something which we've kind of repressed in our family for many years, but you can't see it because it's a black and white photo, is his beard is ginger. It's shocking. It's shocking. He died when I was 12 of a heart attack. He was a Christian man. And because of the difference, if you like, between Adieu and Au revoir, because, in, you know, I know that this man was a saint, I know that it is not a finality of farewell. I will see him again, and he will see me. And that is a great comfort. So whether it is your granny, your granddad, your mother, your father, your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, your friend, you name it, one of the great implications of being a saint is that they're not lost. They've just gone ahead of us, and we will meet them again. There are lots of other things we could talk about being a saint, but I'm just going to draw to your attention kind of one thing. Um, if you look at who this man, do you recognize who this man is? What's his role? Can you guess? Yes, he's a drill sergeant, right? His job is to make you into a soldier. What about this woman? Do any of you recognize who, what this woman's job is? She is a... She's a fitness instructor. Her job is to make you fit. And the next one is perhaps the hardest one of all. What is her job? Make you beautiful. She's a beautician. That's right. Her job is to make you beautiful. Well, if you go back to the text, and, and we're not going to do you know, part of what God's job to do is to make us like Jesus. That's what it says. He says we're God's sons and daughters. We're his children. And although we don't yet know what we will look like, we are going to be made into the image of God. Jesus. Now, that does not mean the image that you might have of Jesus on a cloud or someone playing, you know, these lovely images of people in heaven. Each one has their own individual cloud. They've got their wings and they're playing their harp. No, that's not really what the Bible says. It doesn't say anything like that. But it does say something, and it says this in Revelations. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with people. He will live with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. Let's have some, some question time. Anyone here have a gammy knee? A few people have gammy knees. Anyone have other, another bit of their body they would describe as gammy or wear and tear as you get older? All these things. Who stands up and makes a noise and goes, Phew. I think as you get older, the issue isn't sitting down, the issue is standing up. Isn't that right? All these kind of things that you've, that you've got there. Who's short-sighted or long-sighted? Well, if not, there's a whole pile of people in here wearing glasses for no reason. Right. But look what it says. It says there will be no more pain. How interesting. There will be no more pain. In the world that we live in today, sadly, when some of the folks in our parish and others are having to choose between feeding their kids or heating their house or feeding their kids and the parents kind of doing without, that's not going to make it to heaven. It says there will be no more grief, no more crying. Think of all the time that you have experienced grief in your life. It says there will be no more grief in this place. Everything that's made you cry, all the bad things that have made you cry up to this point in your life, they will all be gone. No more crying. Neither adieu or au revoir will be relevant because there will be no loss, says here. No one will die and there will be no grief. That's what the Bible tells us about what is awaiting for us. So if you are a saint, and we've already spoken about it, says we are all saints, then that is your destiny. That is what awaits. So say to yourself, that is my destiny. Go and say it. That is my destiny. That is your destination as well. That is what awaits you. One of the great sadnesses I've always had is that people in this world do not realize how generous God is. God is so generous that he, he holds this out 
to anyone who comes to Jesus Christ. That is what God does. And we spend so much time, and, and the world spends so much time these days, in self-help, improvement, and trying to find any way of sorting this out except the one way that works, which is coming to God. And God offers his grace and his love in spades, but people won't take it. That is a huge sadness to me. And when we're encouraging people to invite others to church, it's not so that we will have, if you'll call bums on pews, it's so that people will find for themselves what we have found in Jesus Christ. And that is a great strength and encouragement in this world. We have so much to be thankful for that God has made us saints. And just think about this. God could have made the application process to be a saint as hard as anything you can imagine. Imagine if God had said, you need to climb Mount Everest before you can be a saint. How many people would have died trying? But all God said is, just believe, that's it. He is so generous, is our God. And so, we come to the end of our series in Seasons of Faith, and we leave you with this knowledge that you are the saints of God, that your destiny that lies ahead is phenomenal, and that God's grace has laid that before you. So when you say cheerio to people today, don't say adieu, just say au revoir, in the knowledge that we will see them again. But in the meantime, we have our question, and our question is this, what surprises you most about being a saint of God? You have three minutes on that. What surprises you most about being a saint? Where you go.
<clears throat> as always, we encourage you to keep the conversation going over tea and coffee here in the church or uh, with each other on Zoom when the service comes to a close. But at this point, we'll proceed to our prayers for others. And can I ask if there are any names here in the church of folks you want to pray for? If you're on Zoom, if you type them into the chat, and Chaz will read them out. And if you're watching later, if you type them into the comments, we'll pick them up from there. So is there anyone you would like to be prayed for by name in here today? Liz and Brian. Liz and Brian. Angus. Angus. Margaret. Katie. Um, Katie. Yeah. And there was one from over here. Natalie. George, Helen, uh, George, Helen Neville. Mm -hmm. Natalie and her family, yeah. Sarah? Yeah. Anything from Zoom chat? No. Okay. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Father, the idea that we are saints, we find, well, we kind of giggle at it inside because we are very well aware of our own shortcomings. We are well aware that we are not qualified in any way for that designation. And when we look out around the world, we can see people who are far more qualified than we are. And yet we come back to the fact it's based not on our merit, but it is on your grace. It was in an act of grace that you made us your children. It is in an act of, an act of grace that sent Jesus Christ to this world, an act of grace that Jesus died on the cross for our own, for our redemption. And Father, the more we experience of you, the more we understand of you, the more your graciousness towards humanity is amazing. And the sad thing is that you're far more gracious towards us than we are towards each other. Because when we look out, well, we see wars and we see famine and we see suffering. Whenever we open the newspaper, it seems to be filled with, with bad news in these days, we hear it as soon as it happens from anywhere all over the world. And it can be overwhelming to think sometimes of, of how dark the world we live in is. But it is not a world without light, because you've called your people to be the light. We are the light. So wherever we happen to find ourselves in whatever household, whatever community, whatever country, we are the light. You have asked us to be beacons that draw other people to Christ, so that they too might experience the grace that you offer. We know, Father, that a day will come when that grace is even more real to us, when we see truly what it means to be a saint, when we are gathered with the, the, the amount of people beyond number, all worshiping and praising. And that's going to be some day a day, Father, that we, we look forward to, and a day again that is, that is undeserved. But as always, we rest upon your grace, and we ask that you would extend your grace beyond measure to this world. We ask, Father, for those who suffer, that you would help them see that they are loved and that you are with them. We ask, Father, for those who are juggling with the cost of living crisis and what that means, that you would help them, Father, to find ways forward and ways out of this. We pray for those in power, that they would take decisions that help the ordinary person and that honor the, one of the greatest commands, which is to love each other as we love ourselves. We pray, Father, especially today for Pat, for Duncan, for John, for Irene, for Liz and Brian, for Angus, Margaret, Katie, Natalie, George, Helen, Evelyn, Natalia and family, Sarah, and in this moment of quiet for those, that we, those people's names that we didn't shout out.
Father, we offer you these prayers, and we ask not in our strength, but in the strength of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour, that you would answer, and that you would hold all the people of this world in your hands, and that you would continue to extend your grace to them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to proceed now to the sacrament of communion, and can I ask those folks who are helping today to please come and join me at the front. It says in the book of John, John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. This, then, is the Lord's table. And the invitation to take part in this table extends to all who believe, from north, from south, from east, and from west. People will come, and they will take their place at this God's banquet table. And physical distance is no barrier, as we know, to being part of the family of God. As we've already mentioned today, there are those who have gone on before, and there are those who will come after. And there are those who are gathered all over the world, and together we are the family of God. In time, we shall all be united under the headship of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so we say, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. A few short years after his death, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and he offered the following guidance with respect to the Lord's Supper. He said, hear the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper according to St. Paul. The tradition which I handed on to you came to me from the Lord himself, that on the night of his arrest, the Lord Jesus took bread And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and he said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and he said, This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. As the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread and wine, I take these elements of bread and of wine to be set apart from all common uses to this holy use and mystery. And as he gave thanks and blessed, so let us draw near to God and also ask God's blessing. Let us pray. Father, we are separated from one another physically, yet we are joined spiritually. We are gathered as people of different ages and backgrounds, even different shapes, yet we are one in Jesus Christ. The faith that holds us together is stronger than anything that would separate us. We thank you for giving us this sacrament, for the reminder that we are family and that through it we declare again our faith in Jesus Christ and your sovereignty in our lives. Hear this, our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. According, therefore, to the institution and example and command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as a memorial to him, we do this, who on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in memory of me. I invite the servers now to please take that which we are using to symbolize the bread and the wine and to distribute to the congregation.
please take that which you are using to symbolize the body of Christ in your hands. And as I say the following words, eat together. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ that is broken for you. Do this in memory of him. Please take that which you are using to symbolize the blood of Christ in your hands. And as I say the following words, drink together. This cup is the new covenant sealed by Christ's blood, which was shed that the sins of many might be forgiven. Drink from it, all of you. Let us pray. Father, we go from this place, the saints of your kingdom. We go from this place, the children of your family. We go from this place, brothers and sisters in Christ. So through this sacrament, strengthen us that we may be the light that this world so desperately needs. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. It is the tradition of the Christian church that as we share the sacrament together, we share the peace together. And you are encouraged to share the peace with those around or indeed to get up and wander and share the peace with anyone you so wish in the church. When we were choosing hymns to draw a service on sainthood to a close, we thought there's only one hymn that you can have, really, to close with. And so we're going to close our worship with, <clears throat> and let's get the first line up here, first thing, where is it? Today, today, when the saints go marching in. Yes. So uh, more volume is required in this one. All right. Take a deep breath before the band start, and then just hang on in there. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.